afternoon, good evening to all of you from all over the world. I can see uh, some 60 participants at the moment, uh, and I'm sure that it will increase uh, over the next few minutes at least. And um, I can see also on the screen, I can see uh, many uh, familiar faces, uh, friends from near and far, and it's very, very nice to have you all here. So, um, I would want to uh, welcome you all today uh, to this uh, webinar of, of the day, which is on the history and uh, change of status of Ayala. Two topics, uh, but both of them historical, <laughs> if you will. And um, uh, we are very, very pleased to have with us Madame uh, Marie-Hélène Grillet, who is known to all, everybody that ever have been in contact with Ayala, I think, who uh, still uh, still living, because she has uh, been a part of Ayala her whole war working career. Uh, I think uh, at least for 38 years you, you have uh, worked with Ayala, uh, Maria Lenny, you're here. Yeah. And um, your last role was events and documents coordinator, but uh, you have you've had many roles in Ayala over the years. And um, and we know that uh, you are an authority on the uh, on the development of Ayala over the years. You've been a part of uh, almost um, most of it wow. or a lot of it. Yes. Uh, we also have uh, the Secretary General, Francis Zaccaria, who uh, will talk about the uh, the change of status. At the uh, at the end of the session, uh, I will um, uh, we will have a, <clears throat> a question and answer session. So please, uh, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat, uh, or you can raise your hand uh, at the uh, during the uh, the question and answer session, which will be at, at the end of after both uh, both uh, presentations have been performed. Um, the webinar is being recorded, uh, just for your information, uh, and uh, the recording will be made available uh, to uh, the world uh, on the Ayala YouTube channel. Um, and uh, with that, I think we should just uh, start with Marie-Hélène's presentation. Marie-Hélène, could you please take it away and uh, um, enlighten us on the history of Ayala? Well, thank you, Omar, and uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon or good evening to all, depending on your location. Uh, I will uh, share my screen now. I hope it will work. Uh, it's not always easy. I will just ask you if you can see my screen. Not yet. Not yet. Ah, that's a bad news. Yeah, you have to select the, the screen that you want to share. Yeah, I know that, but, 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 you know. Uh, You're almost there. You just have to click on the presentation screen. Yeah. Can you see it now? No. No. But new. Ah, there we are. Oh. Now we can see something. Okay. Oops. Uh, there you but but this is the uh, ah. There we are. Now we are. Okay. 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 That's so it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. That first step. Yeah, now uh, you're all set. Go ahead. I will, uh, with this presentation, trace the history of Ayala as an organization. I won't talk about the technical achievements or very briefly when it is uh, really necessary to explain the evolution. Uh, there will be a lot of events, years, that will say how this brief and uh, I beg your indulgence for that. Well, everything starts with the World Fair hosted in Paris in 1889, and that was the occasion of the very first conference of Maritime Works, organized at the initiative of the French Lighthouse Authority. At the end, whoops, sorry. I can see that you have something that is not necessary there. Okay, 
At the end of the conference, it was felt desirable to create a permanent body that would follow up and provide a basis for the organization of further conferences. This new body was named the Permanent Commission of Congresses of Maritime Works. In 1898, PIANC was created and took over the organization of regular international conferences. Eight, 1900 in Paris again was another fair, world, world fair where PIANC had its very first Congress. And the first conclusion of the conference is still relevant more than one century after. New efforts are necessary due to the ever-growing requirements of navigation caused by the continuous increase in the size and speed of ships. And we are now in uh, 1926. In the intervening period, many things had happened, and particularly World War I, which left a lot of wrecks in the sea. The time devoted to Marinette's navigation during the Piyang Congresses was less and less. Already in 1912, at the last Piyang con Congress before the war, one session only was devoted to Marinette's navigation. The Aiton, as we call them now, people started to think that Piyang was no longer the best place to talk about this matter and ensure consistency and continuity in the discussions. An informal meeting in Kiru in 1926 decided to establish, to establish a, split, split, oh, I'm sorry, a separate body, non-governmental and of a technical nature. The League of Nations shown interest, but this was not Ayala yet. This new created body had no seat and no permanent secretariat. The task was to plan the next conference with a structured format comprising committees and plenary discussions. In 1829, the first International Lighthouse Conference was held in London, hosted by Trinity House. Ayala conferences are numbered starting with this one, although Ayala was not in existence yet. An important feature of the 1829 conference was that radio technology entered the edge to navigation world. World War II, more than World War I, had an enormous impact on Marinette's navigation. Considerable changes in the technology led to look at Aiton in a different way. Oh, well, time goes fast, and uh, we're now at the second level, 1955. Three lighthouse conferences had been held since 1829, based on personal contact between the heads of lighthouse authorities. It was time to create a not too rigid organization which would have the lighthouse authorities play a role on the international scene. The technical work of the lighthouse authorities would be more visible vis-a-vis -vis other international organizations. And the new organization for lighthouse authorities would be known to and would talk to other international organizations. At the same time, the technology was developing much faster than before, and the five-year intervals before conferences was find too, far too long to face the progress made by science. A resolution was therefore passed on 4th June 1955 to ask the conference chairman, who was at that time the head of the Dutch Lighthouse Authority, to undertake to work towards the creation of an international association of lighthouse authorities. A 
as a result of this resolution, the Canton Share and Head of the Lighthouse Authorities of the Netherlands sent in 1956 this letter. I'm not sure you can see it very clearly, but here it is. Uh, to as many lighthouse authorities as possible, explaining the aim and functions of the proposed association. The association will have members and associate members who would pay an annual fee on an equal sharing basis. That means the same amount of each member for each member in each category. And they would get a quarterly magazine, the Ayala Bulletin. This very first constitution was not that different all in all from the current one. The rules have changed a little bit, sometimes not for the best, but the meaning behind remains the same. There were special aims on top, and among them, the organization of the conferences, the maintenance of the records of the conferences and committees, the collection and distribution of all information on the developments in the field of lighthouses and other aid to navigation, the maintenance of permanent activity, uh, permanent secretariat, and many others. What is interesting is that Azalela had some finances. The Swiss franc had been chosen at the Ayala currency because it was financially stable and Switzerland will never be a member. On the 4th and 15th May 1958, I must say 10 days before I was born, the executive committee met for the first time at the seat of Ayala, that is to say the French Lighthouse Service, which had agreed to host the association and provide the staff for free until Ayala, Ayala had sufficient resources. The four founding fathers, the one who had worked hard to create Ayala, were the only members of the executive committee. And from the left to the right, there were Mr. Paul Petri of France, engineer P.J.G. Van Wiedelen of the Netherlands, Sir Gerald Curtis of England and Dr. Gerhard Wiedemann of Germany. The 10 first years were almost quiet, although Ayala worked hard to meet the objectives set out in its constitution. Six technical committees were at work. And it must be said that uh, 1965 was a very important year. It was the starting point of Ayala industrial membership. And since the number of industrial members has never, never stopped growing. In 1871, the way a mark was a wreck was marked in the channel was misunderstood by a captain, and this resulted in a series of accidents with falling ships colliding with the first one. At the same time, IHO had identified 40 different buoyant systems enforced worldwide. IMO decided to, have to task Ayala to enlarge the scope of studies already undertaken to harmonize the voyage systems in international waters. Ayala had already started to work on voyage systems with the technical committee established in 1967. No efforts were spared, but the project was very ambitious and almost impossible to achieve. There was a first agreement in 1977 on a hay system with red lateral marks on port hand and green on starboard and black and yellow cardinal marks. 29 countries committed in, to implement the system, but 
The American continent had little interest in the new system, mainly because they used opposite colors on their lateral marks and could not afford a change. The voyage committee that came with the system B, they differed from system A only by the colors of lateral marks. In 1980, at the occasion of the Tokyo Conference, a voyage conference agreed on a unified system with two regions, region A and region B for the Americans, with opposite colors, opposite colors on the lateral marks. Finally, the International Voyage Agreement was signed in April 1982, and 43 lighthouse service become 43, with another 11 joining later. 54 countries doesn't seem to be much, but as you know, the voyage system is now implemented everywhere. The ship on the photo was not involved in this 1971 series of accidents. It is the Torrey Canyon, the one that generated a massive Holy Spirit. And from that time, Ayala considered that the protection of the environment should be one of its main objectives. Well, we'll just uh, now spoke, speak about the uh, organization of Ayala, starting with the, uh, the governing body. Well, then concurrently with its technical work, Ayala spent no effort to adapt its structure to its current situation with peculiar attention to its governing body. This slide shows the original governing body, the executive committee, and the successive changes in its structure. From 1988, France, which had the uh, position of uh, secretary general, was no longer to be able to fulfill this voluntary and part-time position. Then the next General Assembly in 1990 amended the constitution and the executive committee was replaced by a council with 18 elected members, over 20, an elected president and vice president. And a finance advisory committee was formed with five members elected from among the council to advise on financial matters. And the fact elect one of its members as Ayala treasurer, a position that did not exist before. The council will be later enlarged to 25 members. Turning nine to the Secretariat, until 1979, Ayala was hosted by the French Lighthouse Service. He was not able to continue uh, due to the, the selling of uh, their own building. In 1981, Ayala moved to its own premises, still in Paris. Right, I'll skip <laughs> the rest of it. But in 2010, space was also needed to accommodate the staff that had gradually increased to face the annual activities, which too had considerably increased. Ayala was led by a number of uh, secretary generals which I must say were quite limited in number. If you uh, consider that Ayala was created in 1957, we had only seven secretary generals, and they, they are listed here on this slide. Well, I think this is... Uh, Almost self uh, ex 
explanatory, but it just shows the import, increasing importance of uh, Ayala on the international uh, screen, uh, the way it took over uh, many international events, and especially in 2012, uh, starting a very important role in, uh, in training and uh, also uh, need assessments for the countries uh, that were not really up to date with their uh, aids to navigation and uh, most importantly, navigation safety. And finally, in uh, 2014, uh, because the role of Ayala was growing, but not in status, I mean, it was still a voluntary uh, organization. Uh, the members in general, the council, uh, thought that the best way, finally, would be to be an intergovernmental association. And as a result, in 2014, the General Assembly passed a resolution to encourage a change of Ayala status for that of an international, intergovernmental organization. And I think that is where we are now. And that is the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, um, Marie-Hélène. And uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Yeah, sure. If my mouse uh, is green. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for this very interesting and informative presentation, Marie-Hélène. Um, and if there are any questions, then um, please um, keep them in your mind until the question and answer sessions a uh, session uh, at the end of the event and uh, remember that you have the option of putting comments in the uh, in the chat function uh, or questions uh, uh, as we go along so remember that this is um, a unique uh, opportunity to ask Maria Len uh, questions because uh, she has retired from Ayala now and is enjoying her otium <laughs> in confinement, unfortunately, due to the <laughs> due to the bug. But uh, <clears throat> but this uh, this is a unique opportunity to ask her uh, uh, about anything from the past, um, and uh, she is truly an oracle on these things, uh, as you will find out in the question and answer session. So uh, during, at the beginning, I was a bit fooled by the uh, uh, many familiar faces <clears throat> I saw on the screen uh, from the Ayala family. So I mistakenly assumed that everybody would know who I am. So uh, maybe I should introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Omar Omar Eriksson, and um, and I am the Deputy Secretary General of Ayala. So now we will move on to uh, the second topic which is, as I said, also a very historical development uh, in Ayala. Uh, what is a very historical development in Ayala, uh, namely the transformation of Ayala from a non-governmental organization to an intergovernmental organization. And to uh, tell us this story and give us the status of this, we have the man at the, at the steering wheel, uh, Mr. Francis Sakaria, who is the uh, the Secretary General of, General of Ayala and has been the custodian of this project from the very beginning. So over to you, Francis. Take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Omar. Uh, can you see my screen? Is, is, yes. Yeah, I've shared the PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, Marie-Hélène, thank you so much for, for your fascinating presentation. It's really interesting. I think many of us uh, will know the history from, from uh, 1957, where uh, Ayala was created, but, but the early initiatives uh, dating more than 100 years uh, back to the, the erection of the Eiffel Tower is, is really interesting. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing your, your knowledge with us here today. Well, uh, we will now move on to, uh, to the future, but, but uh, hopefully not uh, 
too distant future because we would like this to, to succeed in, in not so many years uh, from now. A lot of things has happened with Ayala and Marjolin told you that in 1957 there were four members of the association and today I'm happy to announce that we have 314 members of Ayala which is a record high number in the, in the history of the association. Uh, Maria Lynn told you that in uh, 2014 there was a general assembly resolution uh, with the desire to change the association from an NGO to an IGO. And uh, uh, we, uh, we you, if you could please mic mute your microphones, please. Uh, you could ask yourself why? Why do this change? Uh, because uh, if it works, don't fix it. Uh, but there was this strong desire in, in 2014, and uh, you could say that Ayala was uh, still as relevant uh, today as it was when it was created in 1947. But still, there were some benefits of changing the association to an IGO. I have listed some of them here. Uh, there are many more, of course, but these are maybe some of the more important ones. Uh, we believe that the uh, aim of IALA, the development of harmonization of extra navigation is extremely important and it contributes to the safety of navigation worldwide and the protection of the environment. So by changing the organization to an ITO, it was believed, it is believed, that the international harmonization of Asian navigation will improve. Because when we are an IGO, the governments will be directly involved. You know, IELA is a strange hybrid organization today because we have um, national authorities as our members, but they are a member the authority itself is a member of IALA. It's not the government of a, uh, of a country that is uh, a member of IALA. When we become an IGO, it's the government itself that signs up to the IALA membership. And by having the government as our members and decision makers, we believe that the harmonization will improve. It will also be easier for authorities to get budgets approved uh, for the activities of IALA because the government themselves has signed up for, for the membership. We also believe that implementation of the IALA standards, you know the standards that was agreed at the last General Assembly in Incheon, the standards, the implementation of those will be easier and there will be increased worldwide acceptance of our standards when they are agreed by the government themselves. So, of course, this would be a very important step as well. We know for sure that the Worldwide Academy will benefit enormously from being from an ITO instead of an NGO. Capacity building opportunities will increase. It will be easier for the Worldwide Academy to get fund for their important capacity building projects. And it will also be easier for the Worldwide Academy to uh, reach out to the governments, to the ministers in the different countries uh, that we would like to assist uh, in marine aid to navigation and, and BTS. So this is a very important development as well. Then we have the uh, um, affiliation with other IGOs. We have this very important trilogy with IMO and IHO, but also our cooperation with the ITU and World Meteorological Organization and others will improve considerably, and I will come back to that in a little while. Of course, we also see some risks in this change, and we have actually been working a lot on risk management in this whole uh, change period. There was a fear of losing members with this change to an ITO. You know, when a new convention is constructed and agreed, some countries will sign and then later ratify and become a member to, of the organization. But we have, uh, we have 84 national members at the moment, and probably you will not see 84 states signing and ratifying 
very fast to the new convention. So there was a fear to lose members uh, during this process, also to lose our very, very important uh, um, industrial members and also associate members. So that is why we created uh, a transition arrangement that is actually a part of the convention. And according to this transition arrangement, all the members of the present IALA will become um, associate members of the new IDO if they would like to be that. So when the new convention enters into force, all the members of IALA will be invited to stay a member of the new organization as an associate member until their state has signed and ratified the convention. So in that way, we hope actually to keep all the members of IALA during the transition period and even maybe get some new ones. I mentioned the industrial members. It's extremely important to keep our industrial members and the industrial members committee have been very uh, uh, supportive of this change and I, I thank them very much for that. The industrial members will be invited to keep their membership, but they will be called affiliate members and so will the present associate members, but otherwise everything will stay the same. Uh, the last risk I would like to mention is something that many, many people has mentioned to me every time we speak about this change of status, and that is that IALA will be more slow and more bureaucratic and more complicated. Many people uh, compare us to IMO and other big intergovernmental organizations where decision making is relatively slow and um, bureaucratic. And I always tell them that I'm sure that it will not be the case for IALA. We will still be a technical organization with technical people and we will never go into too much political discussions. But of course it will be slower, it will be more bureaucratic, it will be more complicated, that's for sure. I think that's the price for influence. If you want, want more influence, it will be more complicated, it will be slower, it will be more bureaucratic. But if you have no influence, you can be flexible and fast, but if you want to influence the world, you it will be more bureaucratic. So that's the price we have to pay, I'm afraid. IALA has a long tradition for international cooperation. We have been in consultative status in the IMO since the beginning, since the creation of the IMO. I think we are one of the NGOs with the longest history of consultative status in the IMO. We have a long lot of memorandum of understandings with different uh, fantastic organizations all around the world. We call them our sister organizations and we have a very close relationship with all these organizations. You see Piank uh, and you see IHO. We have a very strong relationship with the IHO, perhaps our closest sister organization of them all. I will now turn to another point that has been discussed a lot during the uh, creation of this convention and that is the cooperation and task delineation between the IMO and IELA and also other IDOs. There's no doubt that the IMO is and will always be the big regulatory organization of the maritime sector. IMO cre <coughs> creates binding uh, conventions that the governments will have to follow uh, when they are created in the IMO. IHO, IALA and many other uh, intergovernmental organizations create non-binding standards, recommendations and guidelines. And very important, we input our work into the regulatory work of the IMO. We have seen many, many examples of this excellent <laughs> cooperation where IALA has done all the technical work, all the hard work, submitted it to the IMO and then they do the final <clears throat> polishing and the member states will agree that. This will be much easier in the future because the work of IALA will already have been uh, agreed uh, by uh, the governments in IALA and can be submitted to the IMO by IALA themselves. Before we had to do that via another member state, but this will be um, much easier. And when they it's submitted to the IMO, the member states of the IMO will already have seen it because 
they are the same governments that have agreed in IELA. So this will save a lot of resources, I'm sure, for the future work. So how is the process and how what will happen from now on? It has been a long, long way. Uh, we started the work in the legal advisory panel back in 2010. I was actually the chair of that panel. And I think with us, we have Matti from Finland. I think you were part of this also already from the beginning. And then shortly after the French government was involved and luckily they uh, agreed strongly to this process and they have supported this all the way through since 2010. Then we started in the legal advisory panel and in the council to prepare the draft text of the convention. Not very easy, but a complicated task that was done uh, over quite many years. Marie-Hélène mentioned the General Assembly Resolution of 2014, and that was a milestone because then the General Assembly agreed to this project and directed the Secretary General and the Council to take this forward. So that was really important. With that, we could start to prepare the diplomatic conferences to agree the text of the Convention. The French Republic, again, was very helpful and the French Minister of Foreign Affairs invited all his counterparts to Paris in 2017 for the first preparatory diplomatic conference. After that, next year, there was another diplomatic conference in Marrakesh. I think somebody has uh, to mute the microphone, please. Or maybe Omar, you can do it. Uh, in Marrakesh, there was another preparatory diplomatic conference, and the last preparatory conference was in Istanbul in March 2019. And I would really like to thank these countries for hosting these preparatory conferences. Then the convention was prepared for the final diplomatic conference in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, this year in February. And that was extremely successful. The diplomatic conference achieved the goal it was aiming at, and 50 states signed the final act and adopted the text of the convention. So you see, 10 years after, the convention text, it's only eight pages, <laughs> was agreed and adopted at a diplomatic conference. A fantastic success for the project. This um, uh, convention text has now been uh, translated into the six official languages of the new organization. The new ILA will have six official languages, the same languages as the UN, but only one working language, namely English. So the uh, convention texts are now ready in certified copies of the six languages and the convention will be signed the first week of January by the French government. The Minister for Maritime Affairs of France will sign the convention the first week of January 2021. And then the convention will be open for signatures for the next 12 months by interest for interested states. And when 30 states have signed and ratified the convention, it will enter into force and IELA will automatically be an IDO. This, this can of course take some years. After uh, the 12th month, you can no longer sign the convention, but you can accede to the convention just like a normal procedure for all conventions. So every interested state of who is a member of the UN can then accede to the convention when they like and when they are ready to do so. So this is the story of the change of status and hopefully Ayala will be an IGO in a not so distant future. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Francis, for this excellent presentation on the current uh, status of the, the IGO project, which uh, as I said before, is uh, uh, a very important development in the history of Ayala. And uh, we all look forward to the future uh, as an IGO, which hopefully will happen in not so far distance. But, and also hopefully after this COVID uh, period, <laughs> which will end anytime soon. Um, I have... Uh, a couple of questions, but they are uh, if, uh, in the chat. I will I will save them just a little bit. Uh, but uh, are there any questions from anybody on the floor? If you want to take the floor, 
uh, you can uh, unmute yourself and speak. You're also welcome to uh, to uh, put on your your video or your camera. I see nothing yet. Well, uh, there were two qu two questions, but they were about the same issue um, in the uh, in the chat, and they were about the presentations uh, that uh, have been uh, presented here. If we if we would be willing to share the pres the powerpoints, and uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we will prepare a PDF version of these PowerPoints and we will put them on the Ayala website alongside with the link to the to the channel uh, to the uh, YouTube channel um, video. Um, but uh, now we have a hand from Syed Pave. Or Pavez, how do you? How good, do you... good morning, Syed Pavez. Uh, Pavez, welcome. And uh, what do you have on your mind? I've uh, got a very interesting thing. Firstly, thank you, Mary and Francis, for your lovely presentation. It's good to know a lot of things of what's happening with ILA. I've got a simple question. Question number one is that ILA has got two reasons, reason A, reason B. So what was the initial thought behind it to have a two different reason rather than same reason so that the, uh, the mariners or the merchant Navy officers, when they navigate, they should have the same colors? Yes, uh, so I think this is a question for Marie-Hélène, the, uh, uh, the thoughts behind regions A and B. Why didn't we get one region after all, Marie-Hélène? Well, mainly that was for financial reasons, because uh, in the uh, Americas, there was uh, this very well-implemented system of having a green color on one side, and that was difficult to harmonize because of the cost. If only one system had been implemented, that would have been meant for uh, the Americas, because Europe at that time was much stronger than the Americas. Uh, that would have had an enormous cost. So the decision was to uh, adapt the, the system uh, to keep uh, the American system and the European one uh, in one. With these two regions that are now well, very well known to navigators, mainly a reason of uh, cost. Cost, yeah. And maybe also, Marilyn, because it's not a real problem, actually. All mariners, they are very used to have sometimes uh, red to port, sometimes to starboard, yeah. depending on if you're, if you're inbound, inbound or outbound. So it's not a real problem, I think, for mariners. It's it's very easy to uh, to navigate in either A or B. Yeah, so um, that was the reason. Uh, basically, heritage, they had already chosen a, chosen a color and uh, would be costly to uh, to, to adapt to a, a new concept, uh, totally different, or change everything. So you had uh, two questions. You said, uh, "Say it." Uh, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, another question here is said about. Uh, I think Mari said about 314 members. And uh, if I see on the map, there are some uh, states uh, they are not yet member with the ILA. But what? Uh, encourage them to enforce these uh, ILA boys requirement to the countries, those who are not member of ILA. Um, Mary Ellen, do you have your hand still? Is it about the old question or, or is it an old hand? Well, uh, it's both. OK. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I will keep it for the end. OK, good. And then Francis to answer this question about uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well, the beauty of Ayala is actually that we do not create uh, binding uh, conventions. We we create uh, recommendations, but everybody likes to follow our recommendations because they make sense. So actually, uh, the Maritime Boyd Agreement is followed, like my my land said, I think by all coastal states uh, because it makes sense. There's no obligation. You actually you you're free not to follow it, but everybody follows it, 
And that is really the most beautiful, uh, that you don't have to make binding uh, conventions, but, but the countries follow it because it makes sense. So I think the whole world follows the maritime voice system, also the non non members of IELA. Mm. And and uh, on top of that, there is an obligation in SOLAS to actually follow the guidelines and recommendations of IELA. So uh, there is a strong indication that, that you should do it. In Even a footnote. Though, in a footnote. Yeah, in a footnote. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Mary thank you Ellen, very much. Yeah, th yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Mary Ellen, you had some further comments on these two topics? Or uh, one? Well, yes, actually, uh, I had a further comment uh, about the uh, change of status project, which is not a project anymore, it's a fact. Uh, it is that <laughs> it had been discussed uh, several times, actually, uh, within the what was then the executive committee, and uh, that came in the discussion many times. Another time, it was agreed that that was not a good idea because uh, doing that, Ayala was, would lose its flexibility. But that is not the case nowadays, and it is very important that uh, Ayala moves to this uh, new status. Mm. Also, it was considered several times. Uh, now it is a good time. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So the basic idea is is not just ten years old. It's much older than that. Uh, it has been considered uh, right. several times over the lifespan of Ayala. From the so, very beginning, it was discussed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I have a couple of questions here, or hands raised. Uh, the first one is CFR um, Placido da Conceição. I can't, I don't know. The, it's probably not a name or could you hi good morning yeah probably uh, hello Omar hello uh, long time from working at the uh, Ayala probably remember me as Victor ah. in Portugal ah. oh. oh welcome and <laughs> what is your question uh, my questions uh, first of all congratulations for the work done and the both presentation and we discussed from the past and um, I would like to look for forward to the future. This is a project that took uh, more than the, almost ten or more than ten years. So, what do you consider to be the next um, uh, beacon for the for the coming ten years? What do we do? We envisage large uh, structural change in the Ayala organization, or what will be the the, what you consider the, the main challenge for the next decades? Thank mm. you. Thank you. As usual for Portugal, you uh, you raise big questions, so I will ask uh, the big leader, Francis, to answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much for that interesting <laughs> question. That's that's how you say when you don't know what to say. <laughs> no, it, 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 it would be an enormous challenge to to make the organization ready for IDO status because. Uh, there will be a lot of administrative uh, things we have to take care of. I mean, alone to have six official languages in a new organization is, is a big challenge. And, and we have to make um, all the internal uh, general regulation headquarters agreement with France. Uh, we will have a completely new staff regulation, etc. So there will be enormous administrative challenges for, for the secretariat. For sure, and we also have to to look at the headquarter. Is the present headquarter um, suitable for an IDO? We have to look at that in the future as well. So, administrative for the staff, there will be many many challenges for the future. I think if you look at Ayala as such, um, the the technical challenge for Ayala, and I've said that many times, uh, and and the council has just agreed on a on a strategic white paper. And we see the challenges really are on the digital front. So we have to look at what will happen on the digital front in the future. Uh, there will be mass autonomous ships. How will uh, atons and autonomy work together, etc. And there are uh, many, many uh, test beds all around the world creating new and fantastic solutions. But don't forget that IELA is all about global harmonization. So this enormous challenge of 
combining all these uh, local developments and test beds into global harmonized solutions. I think that's the biggest challenge for ILA and also for the IMO, as a matter of fact, for all IDOs, that would be the challenge of the future to make sure that all solutions are globally and harmonized, just like the maritime void system that is the best example of globally harmonized solution. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Victor? Yeah? Yes, thank you, I was writing. Thank, okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, yes. So I have still two hands. Uh, one of them is Marie Ellen. Uh, I think maybe that's a new one or an old hand still? No, no I'm sorry, it's not a new one, it's an old one. Okay, thank you. Uh, then there's Trent, MG. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have a question for the Secretary General. Uh, if you could please zoom in a little bit more in the meaning of the change of status in the memberships. Um, I'm now representative of an associate member, which I understand will be affiliate member in the future. Um, being also from the Netherlands, we already work with a sort of uh, national country delegation uh, uh, concept. Uh, so how will this change uh, the status of our personal membership? Uh, do we still have the same uh, voice or is it going via official ways via uh, state uh, um, with, uh, representatives? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And over to you, Francis. Very important question that has actually been discussed quite a lot uh, the whole way. And uh, I was very happy to see that it was not only me and the Secretariat that would like to protect the industrial members, but a lot of the member states themselves uh, was extremely well aware of the, um, the added value from having the industrial members in Ireland. So everybody agreed actually that uh, the uh, the position of the industrial members should be kept and the Netherlands was especially uh, interested in, in this so so we are really happy to see that so basically uh, there will only be uh, these two three categories of membership in the new ILA there will be the member states of course the signatories to the convention there will be affiliate members uh, and th those will be the old industrial members and the old associate members. So manufacturers and scientific agencies will be affiliate members. And then we will have some very few associate members. Uh, those will be members where countries have uh, more um, uh, uh, countries actually. So you can have, for instance, Denmark could be a member state and then maybe Greenland or the Faroe Islands could be an associate member. Uh, dependent on, on the member state, but that will be a very specific type. But, but really, the hope is that the present situation of the industrial members, where they can be uh, speak in the committees, uh, they vote in the committees, um, they, uh, they can be uh, working group chairs in committees, etc., etc., will remain the same. And we will, we have already made the general regulations and there the affiliate members will be specified into a group of industrial members. So even the word industrial members will probably be kept. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for the answer, Francis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I do not have any hands at the moment, so uh, we're approaching a last chance. If, uh, if you have anything, there's nothing in the chat either. Uh, okay, well, if we do not have, if we have exhausted the um, desire to to put questions to uh, this excellent panel of speakers, then uh, we maybe should call it a day. Um, yep, yeah. okay, so thank you all for your uh, interest and participation in this, this webinar. Um, we are very happy to see some 1890 uh, participants. Uh, uh, Mr. Sidov from uh, Mogadishu has raised his hand. Please uh, unmute, Sidov. Yes, I will. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you and we see you now. Loud and clear. Yes, uh, I just have one simple question. Hmm? That's the, you see, uh, why 
the world uh, we need to implement or to install atlas on the world coastline as the IMO is applied, uh, applied by the specialists to carry the most sophisticated and electronic weapons on board of the vessels. So, like radar, like AIS, like any other uh, equipment. So, what is how do they, these two are working together? Uh, so, the question is uh, the uh, interaction between the ship and the shore? Interaction between the ship and the in ashore equipment that uh, Ayala is recommending to be infected uh, or implemented. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, it's a tough one, Shiro. Um, perhaps uh, Francis would like to try to answer? Yeah, I, I think also in the question there was this, uh, that you have a, a many uh, kind of traditional ships at, in a long time mixed with very sophisticated ships. And how will all this uh, traditional ships, sophisticated ships and the shore coastal state, how will that work together? And Zero, I will agree, that's a major challenge. And that's something I, I know our committees are, are discussing heavily. And that's again the, uh, the, the global harmonized solutions we need to, to look at, because all these three categories need to work together. And in my view, actually, I think the the most sophisticated new ships, the uh, autonomous ships, they have to be constructed in a way so they can fit into the present environment. I don't think we we should we should look too much into changing our present environment, changing the present Asian navigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In my view, the new systems, the autonomous ships, they have to be constructed in a way so they can fit into the present situation where most of the ships will actually be manned by humans uh, and the, the physical boys will still be there. So the new autonomous ships, they have to fit with this system, at least in the many, many years to come in the beginning. Uh, so it's, it's really a challenge for the constructor of the new autonomous vessels as well, because uh, they have to deal with many, 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 many ships for many, 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 many years that will be manned by humans. So it's a it's a big challenge. Thank you for the question, and it's it's uh, discussed a lot in our committees. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Mr. Sidov or, or Director Sidov down in Mogadishu. Very good. So and thank you also, Francis, for your reply. Um, I will give you one or two seconds to raise the hands if there are any further, if this has raised any further questions. Not. The case uh, there's a ah there's a question in the uh, in the chat actually um, problem with the microphone but the question is now written how should Ayala how could Ayala help those who carry out research in the field of navigation aids with the use of databases is it possible to help outreach with companies in the sector institutions such as the ITU yeah. Um, well, uh, certainly Ayala is uh, very interested in research being done. I can speak on, on behalf of the World War Academy, which has a research and development component. Uh, and also, as I'm over many years, the chair of the technical committees, we are really, really dependent upon research being fed into the committees through our members and participants in committees. Um, uh, whether we can uh, help with uh, with data, with uh, uh, information, if we have the information, it is open uh, and, and, and we can make it available. But unfortunately, we do not have a large collection of information information, but certainly we, we, we would like to pre play the, the role of the facilitator that fa facilitates the process that you are mentioning. So uh, uh, indeed, we, we would like to help and we will help in any way we can, particularly from the academy side and the, uh, in, the, in the technical committees. You will learn that if you participate in the technical committees, you will, uh, you will meet a lot of peers that are working and thinking about the similar topics as you. And there might be solutions inside their heads that you could uh, tap into. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you already are 
uh, the the the, uh, the person posing the question if you already are participating, but if you are not, then you should consider that um, as as a member of IALA. Um, yeah, uh, uh, people are um, moving away. Uh, everybody has a busy day or want to get to bed. So I think I will I will let that be the the last question of the day. And uh, I would uh, like to thank you all for your continued support to Ayala. And uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, almost just a moment ago, we are completely dependent upon your membership and your contributions and part participation in the committees and other activities of the organization. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, this is a, a webinar in a series of webinars. Uh, which basically doesn't have an end date, but uh, we're trying to program a number of webinars on a number of topics that we think uh, are uh, of interest to you. And uh, the next webinar will be held on the 7th of January. Um, and the theme will be um, new documents uh, uh, fresh from press and uh, just approved by the last council, Council 72, which had its, uh, uh, its meeting um, in the, uh, in the uh, just a week or two ago uh, in December and approved a few documents which we think uh, might be of interest to you to, to understand. Uh, so therefore we will make an effort to present the content of these documents and the perhaps uh, consequences of, of that being recommendations and guidelines. So uh, with that, I wish you all a good day, good afternoon and evening, and even good night over there in Asia and Australia. And keep well and keep your distance. I declare this webinar closed. And Thank you. Seasons.